very well. This has been some time since I spoke to you. So it's my pleasure to come back to you this year. I, I hope you can see me and hear me well. Co-occupation biota is a topic which is fraught with some problems at whatever age you are dealing with it. To begin with, fetal diagnosis of co-occupation is a tough issue. One of those areas where the diagnosis of co-occupation is not absolute, but it is a prediction. In the neonates, when the co-occupation presents, especially if there is a PDA, making an emphatic diagnosis that there is or there is no co-occupation becomes an issue. In the grown-up child, especially if you have forgotten to feed the lower limb pulses, you could be in serious trouble with co-occupation. In the adult, it can present within myriad ways. Therefore, co-occupation of IOTA through the age group is what I would be discussing today, even though this title is uh, given as co-occupation in children, we will be discussing it co-occupation at all age groups. You know what co-occupation is. It is a narrowing of the IOTA. The point is, it can be anywhere from the arch downwards, downwards to the ileus bifurcation. Having said that, most of the coarctations you know are just juxtaduction. There is a slight male preponderance in the incidence of coarctation. It accounts for 7% of all congenital heart diseases. And in the commonest data shows that you caught for infant cardiac disease and its incidence, the New England Regional Infant Cardiac Program data, it is the fourth commonest cause of third year, the two third deaths in the first year of life. I, I hope you can see that. Co-occupation, we were saying, is a narrowing of the iota at various points, anywhere from the transverse arc to the iliac bifurcation. And um, the disease comes with a male-female ratio of 1.5 to 1.7 is to 1, and it accounts for 7% of all congenital heart diseases. It is the fourth for commonest cause for cardiac surgery or cath intervention in the first year of life. And this data is from the New England Regional Infant Cardiac Program, the one that we generally quote for neonatal and infant cardiac data. I hope you can see this image. This is a cardiac MRI image of a discrete coarctation. See the narrowing, which is seen in the true juxtaductal portion, which is a very discrete narrowing. Coarctation seldom occurs with such localized narrowing. More often, you have problems involving the aortic arch. So we need to look at the aortic arch in coarctation in some detail because arch hypoplasia is common. 81% of neonatal coarct in a large series, this is the single largest published series on coarctation in the neonates by Professor Lacouge from Paris at that time, now my colleague. The arch hypoplasia was seen in 81%. I had looked at our own data in coarctation in musket. We see a large number of coarcts. I would say an unbelievably large number. We see about 60 to 70 neonatal coarcts every year. In the first 20, 70% 70 had hypoplasia. While in my own series published in 2002, when the mean age was slightly higher, the prevalence of hypoplasia was only in about a third. So if you look at these three comparisons, Professor Lacouge's data which shows an 81% incidence of hypoplasia, the, my data from Mafric Hospital which shows a 38% hypoplasia, and my current data showing a 70% hypoplasia, there is one factor that is glaring. The lower the age, the greater the prevalence of hypoplasia. If you look at it from a practical standpoint, the tougher quarks, they present very early. They do not allow the baby to survive unless you intervene. The older your patient is, 
the more natural selection they have undergone, that is why you are likely to find a discrete coarctation in an older patient. This is the commoner type of coarctation that you are likely to see in an young infant or a neonate. This is, there in, indeed is, is um, coarctation here, but the striking thing is the arch hypoplasia. So this is the common pattern in neonates, a hypoplasia of the distal transverse arch, some hypoplasia of the proximal transverse arch, I'll explain these terms as we go along, and, and there's a post uh, the subclavian coarctation, juxtaductal coarctation with the posterior shelf. This also is a not an uncommon variant. See here, normal ascending aorta, if anything slightly dilated, the innominate is dilated, the transverse arch is beginning to be small, and here the isthmus is terribly hypoplastic, and then there is the coart. Then it becomes normal by the time you are reaching the descending aorta. This is another common variant of coart in the neonate. Why do we spend this much of time on arch hypoplasia? Arch is the determinant of surgical strategy in coarctation. The surgeon would decide whether he would do a left thoracotomy or median sternotomy depending on the presence and the extent of arch hypoplasia. I will be referring to this later. There are also technical differences in the surgery. A discrete coarctation is addressed with a simple resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis while the extended end-to-end -end anastomosis is the technique that is used to address arch hypoplasia. Other techniques of arch enlargement might be required if there is proximal arch hypoplasia. And the presence, therefore, of arch hypoplasia is a determinant of surgical outcome, mortality, freedom from reintervention. All these things will depend on the presence of arch hypoplasia. Coarctation is the common factor. And if you are planning an intervention, whether it's a balloon or a stent or stenting of the arch, again, whether it is a discrete coarctation versus there is an associated arch hypoplasia is going to make a lot of difference. So arch is important. So you, how do you assess the arch? Look at this picture. Here, the arch, innominate, left common karyotic, left subclavian, the isthmus. The proximal transverse arch is the segment between the innominate and the left common karyotic. And the distal transverse arch is the segment between the left common karyotic and the left subclavian. The isthmus is the portion between the left subclavian and the duct or the duct ligament. These terminologies should be clear to you. So when you measure, you measure the transverse diameter in systole in the places where we have marked. You must also note the length of these segments. For instance, this segment, the proximal transverse arch in coarctation is particularly liable to be short, so much so that all the three vessels, the common carotid, the right subclavian, the right common carotid, and the left common carotid may all appear to arise together. And if that region is hypoplastic, that is one substrate where approach from the front is generally indicated. How do you say that the arch is hypoplastic? One of the earlier definitions which John Kirkland had given in the 1980s was to relate arch to the ascending aorta. Today, we do not like to relate arch to the ascending aorta because we don't trust the ascending aorta in coarctation. It can be dilated, it can be small. It does not follow a standard pattern in relation to body surface area descending aorta at the level of diaphragm death. So our gold standard for comparison is descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm. So if the arch diameter anywhere is less than 50% of the descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm, that is hypoplastic. Simple. Arch less than 50% of descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm. Roger Mee had introduced a, a simple rule of thumb to say that 
anywhere if the arc diameter is less than weight plus one millimeter, it is small. This is for neonates and young infants. Mind you, for older children, obviously, it has no meaning. In neonates and young infants, if the weight is 3 kg, the transverse arch is 3 mm, it is hypoplastic because it should be 3 plus 1, 4 mm. Today, we tend to look at the z-scores a lot. So any, dim uh, any dimension which is less than minus 2 z-score is hypoplastic. And you know that C-scores can be accessed online if your own echo reporting system does not have it on your uh, iPhone. You can have a, access to an online site like Parameters, which would give you the arch like any other echo parameter. You, if you feed the height, weight, and your measurement, you will get the C-score. And a C-score less than minus 2 is hypoplasia. If you use multiple parameters, you can enhance accuracy. But believe me, they are all essentially different ways of expressing the same. You have a particular problem when you are trying to diagnose coarctation in the presence of a PDA. I am referring to newborns. You have a day one or day two baby. There is a large PDA. There is a doubt as to whether there is coarctation or not. And uh, especially in a context where coarctation is predicted, this becomes very important. The context could be there's already an antenatal diagnosis of coarctation. You are unable to confirm it in the newborn. There's a large PDA. Or there's a condition like um, toxic wing anomaly which is associated. You are expecting a higher incidence of coarctation or interruption. The PDA is interfering with your assessment. The posterior shelf may not be evident. And the Ismail gradient may not be reliable with a PDA. That is the problem. One of the things which has been proposed from recently from Stanford is the carotid subclavian artery index. The carotid subclavian artery index is relating the distal transverse arch diameter and length. The logic being that the diameter of the distal arch should be more than the length of the distal arch. Diameter of the distal arch is measured at the left subclavian, and the length is measured as between the left subclavian and the left common carotid. So the diameter should be more than the length. So if it is 1.5 times normal, it is normal. In the Stanford series, they found that if the index is less than 0.85, in other words, the diameter is clearly less than the length of the distal transverse arch. There is an 80% sensitivity and specificity for predicting coarctation requiring surgery. So if you feel that you are not seeing the coarctation well, but the distal arc is small, apply these yardsticks. And if it looks small by these criteria, you will probably have coarctation. Similarly, the isthmus diameter can be related to the descending aorta. The normal isthmus diameter should be about two-thirds of the, the descending aortic diameter. So if it is less than 0.64, that predicts coarctation. When you have this problem, remember, start your assessment with clinical. Look for the blood pressure difference between upper and lower limbs. Of course, look for the posterior shelf if you find it well and good. And then look at the distal transverse arch, its length and its diameter, the isthmus diameter. These are the things that will give you a clue about Diagnosing coarctation, significant coarctation in presence of a PDA. Look at this scenario. You have a 36 hour old infant who has increasing pallor, tachypnea, and respiratory distress. When you examine the kid, there is an enlarged liver, there is a gallop rhythm, there are poor pulses in the upper extremities and absent pulses in the lower extremities. This is the classic presentation of coarctation in the neonate. In infants, when the baby has survived this period and is presenting a little later, it may be with heart failure, and the history is that it began in the first month. You're seeing a six-month-old baby, but a proper elicitation of the feeding history suggests to you that the problems had started in the first month. On examination, you find reduced lower limb pulses. There is a murmur, usually an ejection systolic murmur over the apex and aortic area. And there's a bruit 
between the two scapulae, you find that there is upper limb hypertension and the echo may show a cardiomyopathy-like ventricle. The clinical presentation may easily be confused for a dilated cardiomyopathy when coarctation presents with heart failure in infant shape. So look at this scenario. This baby had a few days of poor feeding and tachypnea. Baby is three weeks old. He has hypotension, absent femorals, and severe metabolic acidosis. There is a gallop, and the heart is large on chest X-ray. There is an obvious enlargement of the liver. And echo LV, you are confusing with cardiomyopathy. It's only a careful look at the arch and the isthmus that will give you the diagnosis. How do you manage coarctation, the neonate and infant? You have to make your diagnosis with echo, but in instances where that is difficult, you should res resort to alternative imaging. In the olden days, the alternative imaging was only angiography. Today, you would rather go for CT scan or MRI in the cases where there is a clinical confusion and echo doesn't sort it out. CT and MRI, as you have seen in some of the images that I have shown you already and will continue to show different images later, CT and MRI are excellent imaging tools in making a diagnosis of coarctation. And if you are dealing with a neonate in shock, start prostaglandin immediately along with supportive measures. Your supportive measures would include fluids, inotropes, ventilation, correction of acidosis, and then consider definitive management. If you are in a center, like most of you are likely to be, where coarctation surgery is not available, and you are the pediatrician or the neonatologist handling it, you have to stabilize the baby first and then only transfer the baby to a tertiary care center. And once the center receives the baby, there is an initial effort to stabilize the baby with the various measures that we have mentioned, notably with prostaglandin. And then, as soon as possible, you are going for surgery. This is in the neonate and in early infancy. But if the baby is presenting beyond three to six months and the coarctation is discreet, then transcatheter intervention becomes an option. In many infants with discrete coarctation, and so also in older children with discrete coarctation, balloon dilatation gives excellent results comparable to surgery. <laughs> what does prostaglandin do in neonatal coarctation? It opens the duct, and which can supply the descending aortic perfusion if the coarct is extreme. More often, what it would do is to provide a wider lumen at the coarctation site for anti-grade flow in less severe coart. When the duct is open, even to a small extent, the ductal ampulla is wide, and the ductal ampulla is right opposite the coarctation shelf. So the fact that the ampulla is there, it allows a greater transverse diameter for anti-grade flow at the level of the coarctation. Look at this image. This is classical coarctation. See the ascending aorta? Here is the transverse arch. It's not um, particularly hypoplastic. This is the juxtaductal posterior shelf, which is indicative of coarctation. And you confirm it by looking at the Doppler signal. The characteristic Doppler signal has a gradient in systole. Importantly, the gradient is carried over into diastole, what we would call the diastolic tail. This diastolic tail indicates that even in diastole, there is a gradient between the upper limb region and the lower limb region. And that is very, very diagnostic of significant coarctation warranting intervention or surgery. Coarctation has important associations. This includes Turner syndrome, 10% have coarctation. Vicus periodic valve occurs in a large number. The actual figure varies in different series. This is one that you should presume it exists always, and you have to exclude it by looking at the echo very carefully. Sean's complex, you know what it is, LVOT obstruction, which is usually a complex one, a parachute mitral valve, and coarctation. Mitral regurgitation as an independent problem could also occur in association with coarctation, and extracardiac problems 
like a berry aneurysm or polycystic kidney can also be part of coarctation. But these are things that you will see. Coarctation can be just the tip of the iceberg. When it has more important associations, like a large VSD, LVOT obstruction, in presence of coarctation, a very common pattern is a posterior deviation of the infundibular septum crowding the LVOT. It can be severe, causing a real tunnel, or it can be lesser degrees of coarctation, which becomes more evident when you close the VSK. In toxic wing anomaly, coarctation may occur in as high as 50% of patients. In TGA also, it is commonly associated. Single ventricle and hyperplastic left heart can be associated with coarctation. In all these conditions that are listed here, certain things are common. Ascending iota is small. Proximal arch is hypoplastic. And here I must also add, I'm not discussing interruption as a separate problem. Remember, any of these can be associated actually with interrupted aortic arch, and then it is a ductus which continues as the descending aorta. The interruption comes in three types, and uh, you classify it as at A, B, and C, beginning from the actual coarctation site backward. I'm not discussing interruption here for want of time. Look at some case scenarios. This is a 30-week-old preterm baby. The baby presented on day nine in shock. It was 1.4 kilograms, giving a body surface area of 0.14. It had isolated severe ismial coarct. The descending aorta is only five millimeter, and the arch is three millimeter. This baby was stabilized overnight on prostin and dinotropes. It underwent a simple resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis with good result. And this is the image. This is a baby that we saw in the, a few months ago. What you would notice here, you have the measurements on one side of the screen. The arch itself is okay. Here is the discrete coarctation. This baby, even though it is only a 1.4 kg, this baby did very well following surgery. Case 2 is a 29-day-old baby, which was referred for a heart murmur, weight 2.8 kg. This is more likely the baby that you are likely to see. The blood pressure is 130-70 in the upper limb, 70 by 40 in the lower limb. This baby had both proximal and distal arch hypoplasia. Look at the measurements, 3 millimeter for proximal, 2.7 millimeter for distal. Remember Roger Mee's theory? Plus weight is 2.8 kg, so you must have a 3.8 mm arch. This is obviously hypoplastic. This baby underwent a resection with extended end-to-end -end anastomosis. It still had a 10 millimeter post-op gradient between the right radial and the femoral arteries. The surgeon generally puts a radial radial artery line on the right side and the femoral artery line, this would be the monitoring of the success of the coarctation surgery. And this was the echo of the patient. Uh, I hope you can see this here. You can find that the arch is becoming smaller. The turbulence is beginning in the arch itself and the flow is really squeezing past the posterior shelf, showing that it's a very tight coarct. The case three was a day two baby weighing 2.4 kg. This baby had toxic being anomaly. I'm not showing you the intracardiac echo, but I want to show you the CT angio. This shows an extreme coarctation. Actually, this is an interruption. This is only a fibrous coat. There is only there is no luminal continuity here, and it's a ductus continuing as the descending aorta. This is the typical image of ductus continuing as the descending aorta in a small baby with interrupted aortic arch. This baby had a tough course. The baby had an arch repair by resection and extended end-to-end -end anastomosis. The plan was to do a PA band at the same time. The baby did not tolerate it. The baby underwent an arterial switch two weeks later. Intervening period had some sepsis. This baby had very prolonged ventilation. What happens to the arch, which is hypoplastic, once you repair the coarctation? There's a lot of data to suggest that there's a catch-up growth of both transverse arch and isthmus, which occur in 
in many patients. This particular series is from Toronto Sick Kids, where they had pointed out that their catch-up growth is very common. But in our practice, we more often see a number of patients presenting with significant arch hyperplasia and gradient. This is actually my own patient where, following repair, a few months later, the baby has presented with an anastomotic narrowing at the arch site, at the anastomotic site, and the distal arch is still remaining small. In the fetus, I can't afford to spend more time on the coarctation diagnosis in the fetus. I'm sure the fetal cardiologist uh, who would be dealing with the topic later would um, address this issue. But I want to mention that the contraductal shelf is very difficult to visualize in the fetus. And therefore, fetal diagnosis of coarctation is an appreciation of the smallness of the isthmus and the arch and the aorta and the left ventricle and other features rather than actually making a positive diagnosis of coarctation. A number of things have been used to predict coarctation. To assess the isthmus size, for instance, isthmus has been related to the ductal diameter, isthmus ductal angle less than 125 degree, C scores of isthmus related to gestational age and femur length, pulmonary artery size more than 1.6 times that of iota, in the second trimester, and the mid cavity LV dimension related to the mid cavity RV dimension less than 0.6 in second trimester. There are a number of parameters, and use of multiple parameters would enhance predictive accuracy for critical coarctation in the neonate. And a longitudinal follow up in pregnancy would enhance the accuracy of diagnosis. So, this gives two examples of fetal aortic arch. This one is obviously normal you can see that the arch is very nice but here the arch is small more than actually visualizing the posterior shell which is seen in this case i don't know whether you can uh, actually see it but the smallness of the arch is the thing that will tell you that there is coarctation in the era of fetal diagnosis of coarctation we need to have a clinical approach to the antenatally suspected coarctation when the baby is born if the fetal diagnosis is firm, assess the lower limb pulses and forelimb blood pressure. If it is already there as coarctation clinically evident, start prostaglandin. Otherwise, you may need to wait until the duct closes. In most cases, there won't be clinically evident coarctation. Such babies require follow-up with blood pressure and lower limb pulses until you can do an echo. And once you confirm, start prostaglandin. If the arch is normal, there is no ductus, you can send the baby home. But if there was a fetal diagnosis, it is prudent to call the baby back in four to six months, four to six weeks for a repeat echo, because coarctation could appear in six months, even in six months. Coarctation is a progressive disease. And why is it progressive? The, there is ectopic ductal tissue in the region around the duct in the arterial wall, in the aortic wall, and this tissue undergoes progressive constriction, making coarctation to appear fresh. What you had not thought about in the neonatal period may appear at three months or six months. This is common. So this type of um, an algorithm, if you may call it, is necessary when there is a fetal diagnosis of coarctation. When it is present clinically, it's very easy. More often it's not present clinically, then you need to be careful. In the older child and adult, coarctation produces less problems. Quite often, upper limb hypertension is the presenting problem. And um, the hypertension may be difficult to control. In the adult, it's always so. Hypertension is difficult to control. Multiple drugs are required and still the pressure remains high. You look for the classic radiofemoral and brachiofemoral delay. The pulse may be absent or diminished either on the right side or on the left side in coarctation. More often on the left side, when the coax site is involving the left subclavian also. We used to call it pre-ductal versus or pre-subclavian versus post-subclavian. The truth is, in coarctation, there is always a post-subclavian conduct. The coarctation is always juxtaductal. The only issue is, in addition to the juxtaductal coarct, proximally, how much is it involved? 
if it is involved in the left subclavian, yes, you will get a diminished pulse of the left side. You can get a diminished pulse of the right side also if there is an aberrant right subclavian, which comes after the coarctation, not at all uncommon. So be careful in your exam to look for all the pulses. In the older child and adult, an interesting finding is that they look very muscular, but in the upper part of the body, the torso and the arms look quite muscular. In the lower limbs, they look very weak. Collaterals may be visible or palpable. I'll refer to the collaterals in some detail. And uh, the Sussman sign is eliciting collaterals below the angle of the scapula. You make the boy lean forward, ask him to touch his toes, and then you palpate the region below the scapula on both sides. Suprasternal pulsations because of the dilated ascending aorta and the arch, an LV apex, an aortic ejection click, presence of aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, brewy over the left interscapular region, and continuous murmur over collaterals. These are the findings that you should be looking for. Complications that they can present with would include an intracranial bleed and aortic dissection. More likely to happen in older patients. Look at this CT angio. This is the CT angio in a 43-year-old woman who presented with coarctation. The collaterals in coarctation, they are meant to connect a pre-coarct artery to the post-coarct aorta or branch. The idea is that the descending aorta would get the benefit of the collateral flow. Internal balmary artery is a common source of collaterals, and that is what is highlighted here. The internal mammary artery, in its course down the chest, it divides into the superior epigastric and the musculophrenic arteries. The superior epigastric is coursing down and is meeting the inferior epigastric, which is a branch of the external iliac. And that is why you get these collaterals in front of the rectus sheath. The collaterals that cause rip notching, they're again contributed by the internal mammary artery. The internal mammary artery provides the anterior intercostal vessels. The posterior intercostals are branches of the descending aorta. And as these vessels enlarge, you get rip notching. They don't happen in the first two intercostal spaces because the posterior intercostals are not coming from the pre coarct aorta. They are branches of the uh, pre coarct aortic branches. In other words, they are from the subclavian. Look at this X-ray in coarctation, you must be looking in the cardiac silhouette. Apart from the size, the E sign is the classic thing. What you mean is the dilated aortic knuckle, the constriction itself, and the post coarct dilatation of the aorta. That produces the appearance of an E in the, or, or a 3 in the uh, chest X-ray. And you would also find rip notching. For the rip notching, look at three to six ribs, three to four, uh, six spaces, this lower border, look at this irregularity and hyper density, that is the rip notching. It's bilateral, maybe more prominent on one side than the other, but bilateral. And the first two intercostal spaces do not show rip notching. Rip notching generally appears only by around six years of age. So in an infant, you don't need to look for rip notching. It doesn't happen. This is just highlighting what is the rip notching. Look at these margins. To manage coarctation in the older child and adult, transcatheter management is preferred over surgery. In smaller children, it's balloon dilatation. In older children, say some 25 kg plus stenting, and in adults, definitely stenting. And if you are dealing with tortuous coarcs, particularly in older adults, covered stents are indicated because um, balloon expansion of the iota is associated with the risk of dissection and rupture. How do you get natural history of coarctation? The coarctation surgery by uh, Crawford was in 1944. In the 1950s and 60s, coarctation did not have definitive treatment in a large number of people. So Campbell had this large series which is published in circulation in the early 60s. 
where he noted that the average survival was for 35 years and heart failure was in 25 percent death uh, sorry death occurred due to heart failure in 25 percent aortic rupture in 21 percent endocarditis in 18 percent and intracranial hemorrhage in 11 percent a word on surgical repair of coarctation what are the indications for surgery in neonates and infants congestive heart failure and upper limb hypertension constitute indication for surgery it can be heart failure or shock on a day two day three baby more often it is a baby presenting in shock in older children and adults upper limb hypertension defined as a blood pressure difference more than 20 millimeter between upper and lower limbs that constitutes indication for surgery the different techniques are mentioned here the uh, I would just illustrate them with the pictures. Resection and end to end anastomosis was the first thing to be done, craft food and nylon, 1944. This is what the term means. But you must understand the second technique, which is resection and extended end to end anastomosis. The next picture is coming up to explain that. The subclavian flap iotoplasty. Described by Val Dawson, does not resect the coax segment, but uses the left subclavian. You divide the left subclavian, sacrifice the distal end, and the proximal end is used as an only patch to widen the coax segment. A patch enlargement may be done of arch and iota, risk of aneurysm. And uh, if proximal arch needs to be repaired, today the technique is to give anti-grade cerebral perfusion under cardiopulmonary bypass. This is generally done when there is an intracardiac repair. Proximal arch hypoplasia more often occurs along with a major intracardiac lesion, like a large VSD or a TGA or a toxic wing. So the baby does need a, a surgery from the front. So the surgeon would also repair the proximal arch. And to protect the cerebral circulation when the iota is clamped, they do anti-grade cerebral perfusion. These are the surgical techniques. In simple resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis, here's the coax segment. The ductus is ligated. The coax segment is resected. And the lower end is mobilized and connected to the distal arch or the isthmus. Here, this is the um, co coarctation with some distal arch hypoplasia. So the surgeon is resecting this segment and then mobilizing it and keeping it on the under surface of the arch so that you get a wider anastomosis and that anastomosis is oblique. It addresses the arch hypoplasia and it gives an oblique anastomotic line which is less likely to narrow. So this is the, uh, the arch which is hypoplastic. You see the, the incision on the under surface of the arch and the descending aorta has been mobilized to anastomose with the undersurface of the arch. Further picture of same extended end-to-end -end anastomosis giving you this anastomotic line on the undersurface of the arch. See the hypoplastic distal arch in this image. See the iota which has been transected there. See the length that has already been removed and the ductus that has been ligated. The iota being mobilized to anastomose here. Sometimes the hypoplasia can be so much that the surgeon actually chooses to make the anastomosis on the undersurface of the arch towards the ascending aorta. It actually becomes an anastomosis between the descending aorta and the undersurface of the ascending aorta. This is the subclavian flap. Here the subclavian artery has been tied off. Subclavian, the proximal segment is opened up and being used as a only patch. Today, most surgeons would use the subclavian flap to augment an area which has already been resected. They wouldn't believe in leaving the coarctation unresected, but if you need to augment that area or augment the, even the distal transverse arch, you can put a reverse subclavian flap also. Today, we do compare surgical results with our interventional results. There is some data to show that if you compare balloon angioplasty versus surgery for native coarctation in childhood, the success rate and all measurements, the all outcome measures 
are comparable between surgery and balloon angioplasty. But aneurysm formation is higher in balloon angioplasty and half the patients with the balloon angioplasty are likely to require re-intervention, a small number requiring uh, management of aneurysm in the long-term follow-up. Therefore, uh, it's necessary to make some mention about transcatheter management of iota, uh, iotic coarctation, I'm sorry. The three techniques that we would in, employ in the cat lab are balloon dilatation, primary stenting, and a covered stent implantation. I'll illustrate this with case scenarios. Look at this. It's a three-year-old child, 17 kg. The, the angiogram that is playing on your screen, I hope it is playing. There is a discrete coarctation. The cat gradient in systole was 40, 40 millimeters peak-to-peak -peak gradient. So obviously there is coarctation requiring uh, an intervention. And you can see that it is a discrete coarctation. So we would favor an intervention. And um, so how do you assess the arch for, for the intervention? Look at these measurements. You need to measure the arch in the descending aorta because your choice of balloon or stent will be based on the proximal segment. In other words, if you have a very discrete coax with a nice isthmus preceding it, it is a isthmus that you are measuring. More often, it is a distal transverse arch that you are basing. You should not exceed the proximal segment diameter by more than one millimeter. Your balloon should not be one millimeter more than the proximal segment. And whatever you do, don't exceed the descending iota at the diaphragm. That is the other caveat. Look at this measurement. Here it is some 16. Here it is too much. The, here it is only 10.8. So, and uh, here it is 9.13. The third caveat is do not exceed the coarctation segment by 3 millimeter. So using a covered stent or a stent in itself, we are likely to exceed this. In balloon dilatation, definitely, your coax segment, you should not have a balloon which is more than three times the diameter. You have a high risk of dissection or aneurysm formation. So these are the measurements and these are the caveats with which balloon dilatation is done. Now, this is what was done to this patient. You can see that during balloon dilatation, the AP and lateral views, there is excellent opening up. There is some discrepancy between the isthmus and the descending aorta, which is common. But the gradient has been abolished, and this child is all right at one year without any uh, major problems. What are the complications of balloon angioplasty? We would be worried about recoarctation, very common. But we don't mind it because if you're seeing a three-year-old child and doing a balloon dilatation, the purpose is to buy time till the child grows up and you can do a stenting. So recoarctation is all right. You can do intermittent balloon dilatation with, during this waiting period. Dissection is more important. You can avoid dissection by following the caveats that we said. The relation to the proximal segment diameter, do not exceeding, do not exceed the actual coax segment into three, do not exceed the balloon by that. Aneurysm formation can occur in a small percentage. More often, this is a, a very localized small aneurysm. As against balloon dilatation, a primary stent approach is advantageous because it prevents elastic recoil of the iota. It provides better and more predictable results. It's definitely preferred for when there is an arch obstruction. And you have to use it in older patients because of the limitations associated with growth. In general, we like to avoid a stent until the child is fully grown, say around 10 years of age or so, and about 25 kg plus weight. Stenting will cause less vascular injury, will tack intimal flap to the wall of the iota, it will reinforce weakened areas, and it will reduce the incidence of aneurysm formation. So see this patient. 25-year-old man, incidentally found to have a murmur. He had no symptoms, but his upper limb blood pressure was 160-90, lower limb 130-90. Very deceptive in adults, the upper limb, lower limb blood pressure gradient because huge collaterals form in them and they uh, reduce the gradient. But this patient had an obvious continuous murmur over the collaterals 
and his ECG was within normal limits. Echo showed a gradient of 70 millimeter across the coax segment. Patient was on amlodipine and beta blocker, and the cat gradient was 40 millimeters of mercury. We had done a CT angio, which shows a sort of discrete coarctation, but is tight. I hope you can see this image. This is the actual uh, cat procedure in this patient. The initial angiogram showing the tight coarctation. And uh, the following balloon dilatation. I'm sorry. For the stent is not very easily visible, I suppose, in the image, but the, you can see that the isthmus is well expanded and the gradient was completely abolished. This is the post stent danger. Complications of stenting would involve aneurysm formation, death can occur if you're not careful, neurologic damage very rarely has been reported. Covered stent is the rescue treatment for aneurysms and previous stent related complications. It would be the primary treatment if you are in high risk, if you can predict that this patient has a higher risk of developing complications, which would happen due to a complex anatomy when there is a near interruption or a tortuous aortic arch. And when the patient is 30, 40 years or older, not at all uncommon in countries like India, where it has been missed till then and the patient is present with a major problem. I'll illustrate this to the next case scenario. This is a 43 year old female who had coarctation, severe AR, and systemic hypertension. Amazingly, coarctation had been missed, and she had undergone an aortic valve replacement with a Carpentier Edwards valve 10 years, a few years ago. The CT angio, which we will show, show aortic coarctation distal to the left subclavian, multiple collaterals, and a very tortuous collateral. She was on multi drug therapy on nifidipine, clonidine, prasopras, lasilectone, bisoprolol and her blood pressure was uncontrolled. Clinically, upper limb pulses were of high volume, lower limb pulses not palpable. Blood pressure 160, 70. Cardiomegaly, LV apex, systolic murmur in the interscapular area. And this was the coact. The tortuosity you may appreciate better when you are looking at the angiogram. See the long tortuous coact. This, in a 43-year-old woman, we wouldn't like to stent with a bare metal stent. We need the protection of a covered stent. This is a compliance testing with a balloon. You don't aggressively balloon dilate a, a lesion like this. This is showing that it's an atrium stent. The stent is being deployed, and you will see the result of the stent in the same picture. See that the stent is now well expanded and uh, the gradient is completely abolished. The outcome, six months later, this lady's blood pressure treatment had become very smooth. She was only on a beta blocker. How do you follow a repaired coarctation? Look for local vascular problems like restenosis and aneurysm. Be mindful about ascending aortic dilatation. Ascending aortic dilatation in coarctation is an arteriopathy. Even with excellent repair of coarctation, you can get ascending aortic dilatation, which is proved the same. Same thing with bicuspid aortic valve. Coarctation and bicuspid aortic valve independently can be associated with ascending aortic dilatation. There is cystic medial changes, fragmentation of elastin, and collagen deposit in ascending and paracoact aorta. This say, can be a particular problem. Uh, there is a childhood repair of coarctation. It's a girl, she presents in pregnancy with a dilated iota, there is a risk of rupture. Essential hypertension is common in repaired coarcs when they grow into adulthood. There is one series in which 40% or 50% of repaired coarcs at the age of 40 had essential hypertension. This may be because there is a mild arch hypoplasia or re -coarctation. Or there is a resetting of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or there is a resetting of the baroreceptors. More often, there is a combination of all these. Anyway, essential hypertension should be anticipated when a coarctation child grows into adulthood. Aortic dissection occurs in a smaller number. Premature coronary artery disease is not uncommon. There is a bicuspid aortic valve, 
you can get aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. Subaortic stenosis can occur, mitral valve disease can occur, and extra cardiac problems can occur like berry aneurysm and polycystic kidney. Thank you. Any questions? The question would be that since there is an association of cerebral aneurysm, um, should we be doing a CT brain in all cases of coarctation? No. If only there is a clinical suspicion, say if a, CD, a child with coarctation has a history of seizures or uh, an older, generally in adults, an adult has presented with intracranial hemorrhage, there is a history of coarctation. So in general, it's based on clinical indication, there's no reason to routinely do CT brain. Uh, the question is, can we say mild, moderate, severe on echo gradient? Actually, no. Uh, that's a good question from Prabhat. The, the problem in defining echo gradient, uh, defining severity on echo gradient, is the number of other influences on that. For instance, the presence of a PDA. Obviously, the gradient, you have a tight coarctation, but very little gradient. Very common problem in neonates. Or the adult, tight coarctation, large collaterals, no gradient. This is the reason why we are not defining it as mild, moderate, severe based on coarctation gradient. Having said that, there are certain caveats also. If you find a diastolic tail, that is significant coarctation. Also, if you find that there is an arch hypoplasia, it usually goes with significant coarctation. And when you are looking at blood pressure difference, look at a blood pressure difference more than 20 millimeters of mercury. That is significant coarctation. But we shy away from uh, saying that this is um, 20 is mild, 40 is moderate, 60 is severe. No, we do not use such cutoff points. Any other questions? 